Bé, bona tarda. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. We are here sort of late. This has been caused by the delay. Uh, we uh, accumulated uh, prior to lunch. I'm sorry if you were here at 3.30 sharp. We tried to tell everyone that we'd be starting a bit late just to give time, to give people time to, to eat. Uh, well, we'll start with a session devoted to men and uh, representation. This morning, uh, in the opening session of this seminar, well, I uh, made a brief reference to the importance that representation systems have with respect to other uh, systems that have to do with uh, masculinity. And uh, considering the urgency of studying mas uh, representation of masculinity, we have to see how these representation systems are shaped up, how we represent these masculinities, what is the incidence and how we understand everything, and therefore, what is the incidence of these representation systems on how we devise them, how we act them, and how we can do some politics on, on, on them. To cover masculinity and representation, we have uh, several speakers whom I'd like to thank for, for being here with us this afternoon, and they'll work areas uh, such as masculinity in the virtual context, masculinity in the media in general, masculinity in more literary contexts. So we expect to offer, uh, notwithstanding our limitations, well, to, to offer a rather general uh, map on how we are representing and how we are interpreting the representations presently. First of all, we have Angels Kerabi and Teresa Racresna Pellegrini, both of them uh, renowned experts in the field of masculinity, known by most of you, if not all of you, that come from the University of Barcelona. And they present, they present a speech called Mas Alternative Masculinity for a, a Changing World Literary Representations. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Begonia. We can't see our computer image on the screen. It would be good for us to have. Could you please check? Oh, it's, it's there. Well, there it is. Well, thank you very much, Begonia, for having invited us to this uh, event. Uh, I'd like to thank also Paco Abril. It's been very nice to listen to uh, the activists and practitioners of, on masculinity. I will try to offer our contribution to this uh, discussion about masculinity. We received the program in English, and Teresa and I prepared everything in English, so we'll do that. We'll make our presentation in English. Uh, Teresa Requena and myself, members of the University of Barcelona based research group called Constructing New Masculinities, would like to talk about the last two projects of the book. As English philologists and scholars of masculinities, we analyze literary and filmic representations in culture and in literature, in our case, in American culture, in American literature. Our work initially sprang from feminist analysis of female literary representations, yet towards the end of the 90s, we incorporated the analysis of masculinities thanks to the complex male characters that some contemporary US writers such as African-American writer, <clears throat> excuse me, and Nobel Prize winner Toni Morrison were producing. Compelled by the need to explore literary men from the point of view of gender, we embraced masculinity scholarship as a theoretical tool to approach the codes of manhood. Since then, we have published a number of books on male literary representations that you can find in our webpage. We have analyzed racialized masculinities. We have explored the male body in literature and in film over the 20th and 21st centuries. And we have published several books on how women writers see men. This process has driven us to deconstruct dominant discourses of masculinity and to interrogate men's practices. But as critic James Raymer says, 
to change men's lives, one needs more than recognition of the negative effects of our present ideals of manhood. There must be a recognition of positive alternatives to traditional masculine ideals and behaviors. With this aim in mind, and hoping that literature could mirror or even anticipate examples of alternative masculine practices, one of our projects has been to explore possible alternatives to traditional models of manhood, that is, more gender equal, more racial equal, more class equal forms of masculinity. We have attempted to do this in the book, Alternative Masculinities for a Changing World, this is the book, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2014, in the English version, and in the Spanish version, in the Spanish version, Masculinidades Alternativas en el Mundo de Hoy, which is uh, this book, um, published by Icaria, 2015, and actually the book has come out uh, yesterday, so <laughs> this is a very new book. The, the volume contains, in part one, articles by social scientists, such as sociologists like Bob Pease and Michael Flood and Victor Seiler, and anthropologist Matthew Goodman, and in part two, articles by scholars in the field of the humanities, in this case, literature, in order to reflect the interrelations between both fields of research and to bridge the gap between the social sciences and the humanities. In the book, Alternative Masculinities for a Changing World, or in the Spanish version, Bob Pierce, in his search for non-hegemonic masculinities, explores what potential there is for men to contribute to gender equality and to eliminate male violence and abuse. He interrogates it by analyzing the dilemmas and prospects for men as they respond to feminist challenges about their gender privilege and considers from his broad experience with workshops the extent to which it is possible for men to loosen their connections to dominant subject positions within patriarchy. Sociologist Michael Flott in the book insists on the fact that men who get involved in activities to prevent violence against women take up projects of personal change as well as wider social change since they seek to be the change they wish to see in the world. Anthropologist Matthew Goodman calls into question any clear-cut division between hegemonic and alternative masculinities through ethnographic case studies. And Victor Seidler, in the epilogue, which is a conversation with, between Victor Seidler and the members of, the, of our group, discusses the need to be careful about setting an alternative masculinity as a fixed ideal model. Instead, alternative masculinity should be viewed as a transformative process in time. Seidler advocates the idea of an embodied alternative masculinity where men are more in relationship with their bodies as part of nature, not just controlling their bodies or instructing them. The second part of the book includes the literary analysis of alternative masculinities. And we have a structure, this analysis, around four main topics, and Teresa will talk about this part now. Thank you. Well, in the second part of the book, we had this very challenging um, starting point as literary scholars because we set out to find models of hopeful and positive masculinities that we came to understand as alternative. Actually, we had this debate on the word alternative, what, what, what kind of meaning it had to us. And eventually we decided that alternative uh, means not just the visibility of other possible choices away from normative representations, but also entails this positive and hopeful outlook and, and, and options. To that end, um, in this second part of the book, in the literary part of the book, we focus on literary and cultural representations of alternative masculinities by bringing together the social sciences and the humanities, which is something that we have been trying to do to somehow bridge the gap, bring both fields together. Um, to that effect, the second part of the book has different sections. 
One of them is uh, entitled Nonviolent Models of Manhood, in which we have chapters um, that explore the ways in which characters, literary characters, confront male violence, often um, by a father figure, and opt for a nonviolent model of manhood. We have another section that is entitled Alternative Gender Relations, specifically within an ethnic context. And this section includes the analysis of alternative forms of black and Chicano Latino masculinities. And the chapters in this section suggest a more inclusive ways of inhabiting black or Chicano and Latino um, manhood and, and male bodies. Um, we also have another section in which um, we have alternative practices that um, include chapters that explore um, issues of class, and specifically in, in, in texts such as Paul Auster, for instance, and there's this exploration of downward social mobility and its connection with masculinities, and also uh, the analysis of uh, transnational migrants. This is another of the chapters included there. We, we have um, another section in the book, the last one, which um, is concerned with fatherhood. And this is entitled Neo Fathers. And in, this is where I wrote um, a chapter for. And uh, in this chapter, um, and I, I just will give just some detail about that. Um, in this chapter, I focused on new models of fatherhood and how these new models are pres present in some of the texts, in contemporary texts, literary texts. Um, in a way, paraphrasing Flannery O'Connor and her short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, it was you know, difficult. I could say that a good father was very hard to find in literary representations because we were you know, looking for these positive and hopeful models, right? these alternative models. Um, in my chapter, I explore this this uh, this profound revision on the meanings of the meanings of fatherhood that t has taken place lately, ever since you know the late 20th century. Um, actually, since the 1990s, we have terms such as involved fatherhood or neo fatherhood that have come to represent a new understanding of the shifting roles that fathers have come to play in opposition to the normative father as provider role that emerged in the late 19th century. Um, there have also been varying family patterns and you know, there's been this increasing attention to the right of fathers, right? That have contributed to redefining the nuclear family. Um, the recent literary production uh, in the United States seems to have responded to this growing interest by making both fathers and the different definitions of fatherhood visible. And it is, and in this way, reversing what has been sh this shared understanding in the American critical tradition that fathers have been traditionally absent from US literature. Um, taking then the contemporary debate on fatherhood as my framework, I analyzed basically uh, the text, uh, The Shipping News. It's a 1993 text by Annie Pruhl. And also I complemented that with another text by Jonathan Franzen, The Corrections, published in 2001. Uh, Pruhl's text um, offers very valuable insights into alternative fatherhood by featuring this main character, whose name is Coyle, as a father who moves away from the normative model what perhaps we could term hegemonic fatherhood, and becomes a caring and emotionally attached father to his two daughters. Um, therefore, Coyle is a father whose most salient feature about the relationship with his two daughters is one of emotional invo involvement and care, characteristics that in turn are shared by this other character in the corrections, uh, Chip Lambert. Um, these, perhaps, uh, care and emotional involvement are some of the features that have come to define the new father of the 90s, which presupposes a man whose masculinity is based on active 
parenting, on the display of empathy, domestic involvement, nurturance, and uh, this care about one's children. Therefore, he is essentially um, defined in a position to dominance, emotional control, and lack of involvement, absence or authority, among other negative aspects. Therefore, this text that I chose for this chapter feature these central characteristics, this emotional involvement and care for one's children um, as key to both alternative fatherhood and masculine conduct. Um, both characters in the text become this caring and emotionally involved man by actively opposing their own hegemonic fathers who stand for authority and this lack of emotional involvement and also violent behavior, um, which become this sort of somehow triggering features against which their sons will craft themselves. Um, and therefore, this, this attitude, this, this features contrast sharply with configurations of hegemonic masculinity, traditionally maintained and expressed through a systematic emotional detachment that has been traditionally coded as feminine. Um, and that would be sort of the summary okay. of the second part, if you move on okay. there. Thank you. Um, as a way of conclusion, we ask our, ourselves, do we believe that alternative masculinities would lead to more equal forms of fatherhood, or will they change gender relationships? Um, these questions are, of course, investigated and in the process of being answered. Yet at the end of the day, as, as Seidler says, what matters is that the exploration of alternative masculinities opens up a space for men to question themselves, showing that change might be all, be both possible and plausible. It is such attempts at personal change that this book explores, concentrating on the valuable efforts of some men to try to move on by changing themselves in a rapidly changing world. Okay. This is, this is a, one project that we have been working on, and our current project um, is the following. Okay. Okay. Um, our current project will be materialized in the book titled Masculinities and Literary Studies Intersections and New Directions, which will be published by Rodledge in the series Advances in Feminist Studies and Intersectionality that sociologist Jeff Hearn co-edits, and I have to thank Jeff Hearn for, for believing in our project and for encouraging us to submit it to, to Rutledge. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, the volume analyzes the intersections between masculinity and literary studies while exploring <clears throat> some of what we believe are the latest developments and new directions in present masculinity interdisciplinary scholarship. Applying these insights to the analysis of representations of masculinities in American literature, the book shows how not only is the theory of masculinity studies useful to the practice of literary criticism, but also how literary texts may themselves shed new light, as Teresa has shown a second ago, in some of the most pressing questions within current masculinity scholars. In the volume, social and literary models of masculinity are shown to fit each other, thus bridging the traditional gap between the social sciences and the humanities. What we call new directions comes from a series of seminars conducted by renowned critics of masculinities that our group have, has hosted at the University of Barcelona. Actually, some of you have attended those seminars on topics that we consider, as I'm saying, relevant 
and new to the, to the present um, research on masculinity scholarship. We have videotaped the lectures, um, not the entire seminars, and they are of free access in our webpage. Our webpage is Constructing New Masculinities, University of Barcelona, and you have access to that. Um, we have structured this book uh, around six topics, which combine theoretical and literary discussions. And I'm going to mention briefly some of the central ideas that um, are developed in those topics. Um, the first topic is rethinking ethnic masculinities. And Michael Kimmel uh, analyzes the dynamics of power between hegemonic white masculinity and ethnic masculinities. He talks about how ethnic masculinities are subdued for being both hyper-masculine and hypomasculine, and following Irving Goffman's thoughts, he explores the strategies of resistance to this oppression. And then, and then we have um, Robert Braid Farr. Okay. Uh, okay, Robert Braid Farr. Robert Braid Farr interrogates the concept of black manhood and proposes to decouple the concept of black manhood from black masculinity by providing a chronological analysis of how black masculinity has been reshaped and rethought in different periods. Starting with slavery, he argues that it is impossible to talk about the genuine black manhood since the slaves were not in control of their bodies. Now in this part, in rethinking um, ethnic masculinities, two literary articles accompany the, the, the articles by Michael Keeman and Robert Braid Farr. Um, one of the articles analyzes slavery and masculinities, and the other article analyzes Asian American women dramatists and how in current American theater, uh, Asian American theater, the, the um, writers uh, try to go beyond gender and race. The second topic is transnational masculinities. Jeff Hearn will talk about uh, several aspects on transnational masculinity. Uh, for instance, the role of the national in the creation and perpetuation of specific models of masculinity, and also the concepts of globalization and transnationalization. Lao Sinos Gan, a specialist on Islamic masculinities, um, talks about the figure of the terrorist, um, concentrating on the centrality of gender um, to nationalistic constructions of the state. And again, two literary articles accompany the sections of transnational masculinities. One on the Dominican Republican writer Juno Diaz, um, Aishi Webe, who's here, will write about this. And also, um, Marta Bosch will write about Arab American men written by Arab American women after 9 11. Our third topic is the ages of men. And in this topic, um, Lynn Siegel explores how both men and women are frightened of being old and how we do not like to talk about it. How with men, the fear of growing old is usually encoded as feminine since men become fragile because of the loss of physical strength and deterioration of their health, especially, she says, if it supposes an erectile dysfunction. And she also says that social sciences have not provided much of that evidence in literature of that. Again, two literary articles will accompany uh, Lynn Siegel's uh, um, opinions about aging men. The fourth, um, the fourth topic that we are discussing in this book is masculinities and affect. Thought Breezer theorizes how affect my destabilize hegemonic normative masculinity because it falls outside the linguistic. And in dialogue with Todd Research, there is a literary article that explores um, the film by Catherine Bigelow, The Hurt Locker, in which men, um, a man uh, takes risk in the film. The other topic that we have selected is eco-masculinities. And uh, Stefan Brandt, is uh, going to uh, talks about the interaction of two central discourses in the American literary imagination, which are masculinity and the environment, and how nature figured as essentially a masculine space for the explorers of the Wild West, 
and formed a contrast to the effeminate space of civilization and how this vision is contested in more contemporary fiction. And Teresa Requena will provide a literary article on nature and masculinity in the American scene. And the last topic that we will be analyzing in the book is um, masculinity's end in capitalism. Penny Griffin, we didn't have a seminar with Penny Griffin because she lives in Australia and it was difficult to bring her here. But Penny Griffin explores how masculinities and economic practices interact. And she focuses on how the expansion of the Western style financial capitalism has depended on, but also camouflage, the masculinized and ethnocentric model of human activity on which it has been built. And again, Two literary articles will accompany the topic of masculinities and capitalism. One by David Leverance, he will talk about how capitalism requires the expansion of slavery. And Marcia Cuenca will talk about the value, the shift in value, the value of money in Donna Tartt's novel, The Goldfinch, which was awarded the 2014 um, Pulitzer Prize. So this is our current project and we plan to have it ready um, to hand it to the publishing house, this hopefully, or spring 2016. Okay, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Angels. Muchas gracias, Teresa, por esta presentación. Nuestro próximo ponente es Iván Zambade que viene de la Cátedra de Estudios de Género de la UBA en Palencia y nos hablará sobre masculinidades, cambio social y representaciones en la cultura de masas. Sí. Eh, bueno, pues en primer lugar, eh, por supuesto, agradecer eh, a Begoña, thank you a, very a much. Uh, All well, I would like to thank Begoña, Paco, Christian for their invitation, uh, for having me participate in this congress, and of course I was uh, very happy to be here. And without further ado, I will start introducing and talking about my speech. Let me see if I can. Yes. Yeah, computer scientists, I'm, I'm not good at computers, and uh, moreover in uh, English it's not that easy. Anyway, we, I would like to talk about uh, the social changes, uh, and this is not new, it's well known. In the last few centuries, uh, we've gone through one of the most important monetization social uh, processes of, of history, women fighting for equal rights and freedoms, and it was done in a non-violent way. At the same time, there are, have been other struggles, such as, for example, the struggle of uh, people, uh, uh, of those groups uh, of non-normalized uh, uh, sexuality to have total freedom as well. And all of these changes, these social transformations, have transformed masculinity, because masculinity are practical, social-cultural, uh, creations, as we mentioned. And uh, if there are new masculinity and if there are transformations to masculinities, we also understand that there's changes in the representations of masculinity, especially in an audiovisual mass media culture such as ours. What I would like to analyze here is if there are some models that have been mentioned, metrosexual, spornosexual, bisexual, uh, which is a part of a metrosexual form that uh, regains, that gets back uh, the uh, traditional masculinity forms. Does that have to do with uh, women, them being their objects of desire, and that this has been publicly accepted? Does this have to do with the vindication of homosexual uh, men as a desire object, uh, and uh, also Paternity and maternity, there's been also important change globally and uh, here in Spain as well. I remember in the last 50 years or in the last 35 years, we've gone from 
a paternity that was a disciplinary paternity to a more involved paternity. We are more involved in care and uh, participate more in uh, take care as well. Of course, there are inequalities in the use of time and work. They still exist among uh, uh, women and men. Uh, Paco published uh, an article along these lines in Prisma Social that was very interesting. We have other representations, such as the representations of feminine masculinity and gay subcultures, bay, letter, etc. And uh, we would uh, question uh, here if these representations converge in equality. Are they a uh, neutral representation and they just represent what's happening? Or do they mean resistance uh, in these changes toward gender equality? We need to say that mass culture and this construct uh, built by mass media is a plural and a fragmented reality, fragmented in the different uh, constitutional uh, uh, spaces and uh, also uh, because of the main uh, communication mechanisms. Here we have the first characteristic of the represented uh, masculinities, uh, especially metrosexual and these new models. They are also fragmented. They are multiple, uh, plural. There's no coherent uh, story on what metrosexuality is. Yesterday we heard, we heard about coherent uh, a story about that's not projected in mass media. Metrosexual could be a mythological hero, a warrior, or a path, uh, someone uh, struggling for peace, and uh, all the three of them could be considered metrosexual. And these masculinities have been developed not only in these changes towards equality, but also within the inertia of the consumption capitalistic society and the information society. But let's start. Uh, uh, from the hypothesis that the representation of men and women in mass media culture is equal, that we are there represented as subject at the same level. We could also say that it is, if it's a, uh, equal fiction, if, it's, if this equality is or not, to see if this is true. The first thing that we can see when we analyze uh, the uh, um, image of masculinity is that uh, men are represented as social success objects. Uh, at the news, we have politicians who represent our states. We see business men. They represent the economic power and also football players who are trained bodies uh, to win a competition. What Norbert Elia said a long time ago is important. Uh, the team uh, competitive sports are a symbol of war and they have gone beyond the values of war and we have specific representation of warrior heroes that through violence they protect us from um, the evil and they spread good in other societies. And we also have romantic heroes, those men that are still saving women. Because as we know, in the patriarch idea, a woman without a man is not a subject. It's an incomplete being. And how does this representation create is created? Uh, Pilar Lopez Diaz uh, points out in an article in a Research study that in the news, radio and television news, women were still more represented than women. Three versus one. Uh, women are represented in the public sphere and uh, women are, are not. And this contrasts with the reality that women, every time more, they are present in the public sphere. And of course, there is inequality in uh, power quota, and uh, also there are, is social inequality. But uh, the presence of uh, women in the social layers, well, they're there in all different levels. They are citizens, uh, uh, but this is not represented that much in the mass media, at least in news, as Pilar Lopez Diaz says. And uh, if we focus on the cinema, 
and its representations, we can see that uh, most films are produced, directed, uh, and characterized by men. This means that through uh, films, we men, we have the idea that we are the subject of the story. We're always the protagonist uh, and uh, that in front of women. So the first consequence along these lines is if I have this representation of myself, what will happen to me when in my social uh, reality I find women who have an authority, such as doctors, uh, judges, etc. I will feel frustrated. Who am I going to blame it on? I'm not going to blame it on myself. I'm going to blame it on those people who do not allow me to feel represented in this. Uh, hegemonic model. There are other masculinities, but they are uh, not uh, represented uh, enough in the mass culture. And this uh, is what I was talking at the beginning. Even uh, the uh, ill uh, batteries uh, are not represented enough. And uh, I would I like to talk about the model of the metrosexual or sporn sexual uh, model to uh, uh, set a debate with uh, some of the members here. Because uh, if we ha see the fragmented plural reality, we see the icon of um, the metrosexual man, that he could also be a, a man, he could also be someone looking for peace, searching for peace, and they could also evolve to uh, spawn sexuality. Uh, are they uh, a desire of, uh, an object of desire? If uh, we uh, focus on the pornographic discourse, we can see that this is not the same. This is uh, not the same women were still subjects. We have uh, athletic uh, bodies and we can just achieve this through physical activity. The bodies of women are uh, hypersexualized. Uh, they need to go to the gym, so to the operating rooms. And the, represent the colors that represent them are gray, blue, black coolness, cold, and women are represented with uh, uh, um, brighter colors. They are vulnerable, and there's still a representation which is more or less the same, but there is a reality hidden there. Women are represented as subjects, but women are still represented as objects, objects of sexual desire. De hecho, lo que en realidad... What uh, David Beckham is a social success uh, case and uh, the canon of uh, male uh, beauty. Well, it's very interesting to see, as Maria Gómez Cabo said, this canon is the same since the classical antiquity to our days. Is the canon of the athlete and and, 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 well, and gymnastics was a preparation of men for war to. Uh, this, to tame their bodies and their minds, their subjectiveness. And this model has a hypertrophic variant, hypervirility, something which yesterday we talked about, the cultural origin of hypervirility was. But I would like to point out that hypervirility or uh, the bodies of bodybuilders are achieved through the use of steroid use, as Mark said, and this is very dangerous. Uh, it's been studied that the consumption of these substances can generate cancers as well as other uh, cardiovascular disorders, endocrine disorders, etc. In many cases, this can lead to death. And uh, I would like to point this out because yesterday Mark pointed out the difference, and I agree with him in that there is a, a difference. Before, there was no such vanity. Men were machines, cold machines. They were not sensual. And they didn't want to be desirable. Now men want to be desirable. They want to be desirable. But uh, there, no. This is objective as, uh, as a subject to be desired, but they are a subject. Uh, the, the, sub the object of their sexualization is the social success. This is in the rationale of power. And what uh, this truly identifies the hegemonic power is uh, the hegemonic masculinity is power. I like uh, Celia Amoros' uh, text where she, uh, in, uh, from the identical to the equal uh, book uh, that gave her the national award of uh, says, 
She talks about how men are built through agreements, patriarchal agreements through a formal structure reproducing power. In any moment, she speaks about the characteristics of masculinity, if, they, if it's uh, strength, rationality, etc. She makes a structural definition of how masculinity is. And this is the he he hegemonic masculinity perpetuating power through the adaptation of the patriarchy to the different social and economic contexts. Women with social success uh, are depicted how? Because here we have social, uh, socially successful women because of their uh, status through a canon of beauty of the hypersexualized women. I had this image just to show you the differences again with uh, the representation of the new masculinities. A masculinity that I think is very interesting is masculinity that we can see in the pornographic uh, discourse because pornography presently is uh, highly consumed after its accessibility uh, through the internet and through the uh, computer media widely used by teenagers, people that quite often have not even had the first sexual contact and they learn to become familiar with sex through pornography. So what is really surprising about pornography for me is that there's no face. Must pornography masculinities have no face. And usually uh, are represented by a face. But here we have a phallic representation of masculinity. The protagonist of the action is the penis. And we have another subject, which is the subject that observes and watches uh, pornography while taking uh, a penis as the subject of action. I could be told that women also watch pornography. The statistics also say that pornography, hegemonic pornography, is produced uh, and consumed by mainly by men. Other than that, the sexuality that is represented is usually sadic and misogynic or misogynous. They represent sexual violence against women as a rule, something which, well, you know, they, if people freely decide to uh, have a sadomasochist uh, intercourse, well, they can do it. I mean, it's an option, it's their option. But this should not be the rule. And mainly in the direction of women towards, uh, men towards women, I'm sorry. Uh, women are now represented as free subjects who want and accept the, the, the uh, sexual violence. The rule of erotism has changed before these women uh, were, had an imminent sexuality. They were found fatals uh, and they were uh, penalized for having such sexuality. Now they don't, they enjoy it. What we can see is the banalization of sexual violence and some kind of a phallic narcissism. And again, here we have the canon of uh, women's beauty, which is not far uh, from uh, social success and the actresses in the pornographic uh, sphere. It's on a, we can't, we, we have to talk about the, the feminine or canons versus the male canons. We had two in the case of the, the, the women, extreme ectomorphs which uh, represent women as weak, thin, skinny uh, people to be protected, and then the hyper-sexualized the model, which we mentioned, generates pleasure uh, when women look at them. And it still projects the idea of weakness. These women had to be protected. From who? Well, from men. Men that rape them, that uh, harass them. But we are in a dichotomy, which says, one is good, one is bad. One uh, attacks, one protects. Very interesting. I don't know if I still have time to talk about this. Well, then I have enough time. This text from Natasha Walter, uh, she was a feminist that in the 1980s said that the patriarchy had, or, or was that? Now she said she was wrong. And she says it very well in this case. And she talked about how the patriarchy has redefined the uh, subject objectualization of women through the feminist message of uh, sexual freedom. The new uh, feminist res uh, discourse has been reinvented by the power definition of the masters to turn them upside down and then have once again the 
uh, sexual objectivization of women. How? Well, she says, through the homogeneity of the model as a rule, women of social success, actresses that emulate uh, heroines that can be the role models to, for teenagers, uh, dolls, Disney uh, models, well, all of them are hyper-sexualized uh, role models. We also have a pseudo-scientific literature that justifies the differences between men and women in biological terms. And I really like this text because Natasha Walter makes an excellent graphic study, an anthropological study, which shows how the sex industry works from the soft porn we see on a TV a commercial to justify prostitution, to justify the use of women as objects in this cause in our culture. The free choice uh, is a false model. If there's only one model, how can you make a choice? Well, besides, she said that if this were true, women choose it and it just generates the power in women, we wouldn't see more sexual violence. There would be no anxiety to achieve a physical, unattainable uh, model. By natural means, prostitution would be a profession to allow social uh, increase uh, and, and recognition, which is not true. Well, many women say that are against it, have no voice. It's come as media uh, is not representing uh, the mass culture of people who are against this representation. Therefore, so we can reach my conclusions. The first that I have is the last one after uh, what we just said, or I just said, is that the power of the definition of the mass uh, culture is the power definition of the patriarchal power, which, as pointed out by Celia Amoros, meta-stable, which, which means that it is accepting the form of the social and economic hegemonic model. Besides, I think that the multiplicity and fragmentation of uh, different masculinities are still vertebrated by the hegemonic masculinity, understanding that the hegemonic masculinity is the masculinity, no matter what it, uh, what it looks like, that still perpetuates men in positions of power above women and above other cate social categories of men who do not represent this form of masculinity, masculinity the hegemonic masculinity. And uh, finally, uh, this is the general idea that I would like to, that I wanted to convey through this presentation. Say that uh, mass culture is a strategy in the Foucaultian format of perpetuating the patriarchy, because uh, right now uh, we have men, men, men and women, we have seen men and women as socially successful subjects in an apparently egalitarian sergeant working in a meritocratic uh, sphere. We have men and women with equal opportunities that, that have a position depending on their merits. This is very deleterious for the masculine subjectivity because men do not see uh, the patriarchal dividends. Uh, they believe that if they are there, it's because they deserve it. And if they have uh, any power on their uh, partners, <coughs> generally women, it's because they you know, worked hard for a certain reason, so the scientific uh, others explanations. And the final one is that uh, a warning that to equality, because this fragmentation of mas represented masculinities is still present in our subjectivity, as uh, pointed out by Michel Foucault or Judith Butler. Uh, power is constructive and subjectivity is multiple. Therefore, uh, below uh, our layers, uh, different subjectivities, it's very easy to have a hegemonic masculinity there, inviting us to reproduce our privileges. And that's all I had to say. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Iván, por tu presentación. Iván, por tu muy interesante presentación. El ponente es Eric Gómez. El speaker es Eric Gómez, de la Open University de Cataluña, en Barcelona. Él va a hablar con nosotros sobre 
virtual masculinity is the materialization of a gender politics. ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Oh, good afternoon. What I will present to you and the general topic of my research and of this presentation has to do with the masculine representations of men who have sex with other men in different social networks. Particularly, I will talk to you about three social networks. Liner, comparing the context of uh, Barcelona with a Brazilian city called Manaus, Instagram, and Tumblr. These findings are part of my PhD research and a research about selfies of the research group called Media Actions. Media Actions. So the questions that oriented this uh, research with respect to masculinity are, what is the range of bodies available shown in these apps? Are there any bodily trends that are similar in the context of uh, this study? Are there any differences in the way in which forms of masculinity and gender are incorporated in uh, the areas that we studied, which are the most visible or generic prototypes of masculinity, which characters were uh, identified during the process of research, and what are the objective positions, uh, political um, elements that are part of these platforms. In, well, for this presentation, I will mainly focus on the bodily representations well, first of all, let's look at Rainler. Rainler is a pioneer network uh, using geolocation as uh, a way to pick up people and sexual partners. But, however, the use of this network vary depending on the location. As elements of presentation, this network has uh, enough room for a single picture, um, interests, and activities, proposing users to uh, participate in tribes uh, which in the gay culture evoke different body types and uh, sexual practices allowing emoticons to represent practices and practices and preferences this together with the names of the profiles are used as a way to to catch uh, other people's attention together with the pictures of course there's a predominance of bodies identified uh, with the masculine hegemonic masculine bodies, athletic and, mus and, 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 and strong bodies, not necessarily young, both in Brazil as well as in Spain. These are the, highly, the most valued bodies. Some profiles state that, other, that these people use their own pictures, not using other person's pictures to sell their bodies. Another difference is that in Brazil, they don't show faces so much. Los símbolos XL, XX. Extra large, extra, extra large, and some other uh, emoticons like a uh, uh, neck plant or a baby bottle, milk bottle, shows that one of the main attributes is the penis size. Not very many references are made with respect to intelligence or other practices. In Barcelona, we identify a big amount of profiles of escorts, all of them with this type of bodies and extra large uh, penises, as if these uh, elements were so valuable in the community, uh, so that if they have them, they can charge to offer a sexual experience. With respect to the textual elements, we observe the many different elements that uh, have to do with a masculine attitude, acting as men, not a feminine. Amongst these men that have ex sex with other men, there's a stereotyping, uh, stereotyping uh, with uh, masculine values of being an asset and uh, feminine values a liability. In the Brazilian context, we found some heterosexual profiles as they are identified that look for discretion in their relations, whilst in Barcelona, these profiles are not that, uh, uh, are more scarce. The, uh, so these profiles. Uh, sometimes called hypercritical to this heteronormativity. These hegemonic bodies, we have also bears uh, with big, hairy bodies, and that is associated to older people in Barcelona. Different profiles use the emoticon of a pig, which is not related to a bodily type, but with a type of uh, practices defined as vice, 
and this is related with the consumption of drugs and group sex. In this app, there is a quite clear vision of who look for uh, protected or non-protected sex. In the studied context, we see the figure of the PrEP, people who take antiretrovirals as a way of prevention to avoid HIV infection. So that the AIDS virus, HIV and, and AIDS are an important element for the building of sexuality in the gays from different positions. Also, we can uh, see in this app some transactions which sometimes offer their sexual services mainly in Barcelona. They are identified as trans, tranny, TS, and generally speaking, they show a hyperfeminization. As uh, well, it's worth mentioning that the greener is very restricted on how body should be shown. For example, they won't allow people to show themselves. Uh, in underwear uh, facing the camera and they can just uh, show hints of their genitalia through a uh, swimming dress versus underwear. Let's continue with Instagram. Instagram is a social network based on sharing pictures and videos which are labeled through these so-called hashtags that can be used to capture uh, pictures uh, uploaded by users when looking for hashes that include the word gay, as we can see in the picture, we'll see that there are millions of pictures. However, since we are browsing through the hashtag, depending on the day, we can just find a few. Sometimes uh, the users uh, load pictures that the network does not consider appropriate. So we cannot find as many pictures. Instagram is quite permissive, though. We can see partial nude images, but we cannot see genitalia. This means that hashtags uh, are constantly being checked. Uh, and uh, for users, uh, showing the penis is something important, despite of all of these policies that are limiting this issue. You can show the bottoms, though, and there are some pictures where you can see them. And as for penis, uh, uh, users are trying to show them somehow through pictures and uh, some uh, suggestive postures, and it's a way of overcoming this uh, kind of control. It's the idea of getting uh, sexuality or gay masculinity without a penis. That's uh, something that we could see in these networks. Uh, in Instagrams, we see the hegemonic body, the spornosexual body. That's the main body, although we can find all different kinds of bodies. In Instagram, we also see references to new genders, such as gender fluid, agender, femboy, pansexuals, ambiguous, uh, questionings, and uh, many others. I mean, you can uh, see lots of hashtags that identify these groups. Many of the people who use these kind of hashtags uh, in uh, their presentation, they use this kind of concepts to try and look for uh, an acknowledgement, a recognition in the space. They can uh, be uh, fake uh, people, though. Some of them are shown with uh, suits, but with this uh, hashtag, there is a mixture of the image and the hashtag itself. The images of this kind of uh, people, the body of this kind of people, do not they don't correspond to the hegemonic body. Many of them are thin, uh, feminine, with uh, facial traits that could be called ambiguous. And the users that identify themselves with this kind of uh, gender are usually young. On the other hand, we can also find several profiles that use and show the transsexualization process. And when following this process, we can see that for transmasculine people, it is important to develop the most important trait linked to masculinity, which is muscles. 
The testosterone consumption is quite generalized and it is well appreciated as you can see in hashtags. In transmasculine, testosterone makes a difference and it's called vitamin D. And here we can see the processes. In Instagram, we also see activist uh, profiles uh, associated to the struggle for equality, such as rich adoption, non-discrimination, uh, uh, access to antiretroviral, participation in demos, uh, or we, they also document how the daily normal day of these people who have this kind of family and who've made this kind of decision is. As for the body, there is a new kind of activism coming up, which is HIV and the body. And this has to do with all of the progress uh, carried out in the treatment of the HIV, of this infection, and a new prevention, which is PrEP. It's easy to find profile of people who uh, are proud to show this uh, treatment and uh, then we have prep work as a result of this, which is the gay who has sexual relationships without a condom, but not without protection. And uh, here we have these forms, uh, here they talk about fetish, sexual preferences through images and hashtags. And this enables us to see the great range of uh, the sexual activity among these people. In a subtle, subtle matter, manner, we can also find sadomasochism forms. And uh, that's, that was in um, Tumblr. Tumblr is a blog network which, is which introduces itself as the network that has everything, that uh, uh, allows everything. You can have your own content and other's contents, and you can generate new, con uh, new content as well. And that's why we have contents that are not accepted in other more restrictive networks. In Tumblr, besides all of these things that we've been talking about, such as the preferences, activism, they talk about sexuality and gender. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, what we see can contradict the discourses of gender equality and fundamental rights. Uh, and all of these uh, feminist uh, discourse and gender equality that we will be talking about throughout the conference. Browsing through different blogs, we could see that uh, the figure of alpha real men is quite extended. It uh, represents the stereotypes of the macho and those stereotypes uh, those kind of stereotypes. It's a kind of flagship figure, adored figure. Alpha has the power to use other men that have a questioned masculinity through some domination practices. So they are treated like if they are an object uh, there, like nearly zero. And through this process, uh, the discourses tell us that uh, they can free from the fake masculine identifications and we help them in uh, their path of accepting their inferiority. In Tumblr, we can also see blogs that talk about extreme sexual uh, practices, uh, risky, incest, violent, uh, mutilation. All of this is eroticized through different videos, gifs, pictures, and they can express all of these trends in a very evident manner, not uh, as in Grindr or Instagram, although we can also find some suggestions there. And all of this is represented through the users of this net of all different uh, ages, including many young people. In this network, we can see new practices such as uh, distance dominance. Uh, it's all in the virtual uh, sphere and also being exposed in a humiliating manner in this network. 
uh, identifying yourself as a slave, uh, Farad, uh, your uh, uh, pleasure product, and this is something which is quite disseminated. It is quite surprising to find neo-Nazi gay discourse in Tumblr. This could be a little bit of a contradiction, but this happens. They say that they have a racial superiority. And there's also the black power discourse uh, in parallel there. And they say that they are the superior men. So over here, we can see that there's lots of violence, uh, contradictions, uh, demands, uh, this kind of issues. In a very summarized fashion, we can answer the questions that we said at the beginning. We can see that in these networks we can find a wide range of the different kind of masculine bodies. The young hegemonic uh, muscle body to bodies that are not that valued in the gay culture, but uh, that they uh, are present in several communities. And there's other bodies that question the dichotomy, masculine-feminine, and you need to choose. There's different forms in which the masculinity of the bodies were presented, depending on the diff politics of the content of the different apps. And there's constant attempts uh, of the users to represent their ideas of gender and political and also uh, the body images, overcoming the control and politi uh, the politics uh, of the different sites uh, and networks. The most generic prototype is the hegemonic masculine uh, body, the sporn sexual body. Although there are other bodies represented, we also identify different characters, activists, homosexuals that are uh, struggling for equal quality of uh, rights, uh, also people who question gender, people who struggle against uh, AIDS, uh, people who want uh, risky uh, sex, safe sex, masochism, violence, uh, inequality of gender, lack of rights. There's uh, also some uh, messages uh, social messages uh, of uh, an, uh, there's an equality society that go uh, to these sites and they say we want uh, uh, safe sex uh, and uh, we want a society of equal rights and that's what society uh, says about uh, these sites. So we can see sexuality in this sector that uh, in, in this uh, sector we would uh, uh, expect to find something uh, linked to equality, but no, we find lots of different things, and that's uh, some of the findings. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Eric. Thank you very much, Eric. Our last speaker is Mark Simpson. He is uh, like in all cinemas where we had two films. Well, uh, he's, also, he's also giving us two speeches. Yesterday he spoke to us, and today he's going to talk to us about the anal uh, iti, dominant masculine uh, anal iti. He is a journalist, and he comes from the UK to be here with us. Thank you, Mark. In the Anglo world, I'm not so sure about the non-Anglo world, uh, November, is the month of um, prostate health awareness. Uh, more generally, male health, but particularly prostate health, I suppose because prostates are usually owned by men um, rather than women, so they're a kind of male gland. Um, and things go wrong with prostates. Um, <clears throat> prostate cancer affects 42,000 men a year in the UK and kills 11,000. And the name given to this uh, uh, month of remembrance or awareness is Movember, which in English is a play on moustache, 
MO is the beginning of the word moustache, uh, so Movember. And so uh, men were encouraged to grow moustaches to signal the issue and the awareness, which is, all, which is a very good thing, of course, and um, prostate cancer and a lot of male health issues have been neglected. Um, although apparently Movember is in decline in the Anglo world somewhat because so many men have got moustaches anyway, come Movember. So they have a, a bit of a problem now. It, and it, it was founded, um, I think, about 10, 15 years ago in Australia, but it, it did spread. But worthy as that is, that issue, I would like to, um, to take that as a, as a starting off point, talking about the male body um, in a particular, perhaps predictable for me, way, which is that prostate glands aren't just for cancer, nor are they just to produce an alkaline secretion which helps sustain sperm in the vagina. They can also give a great deal of year-round pleasure, mind-blowing, leg-shaking, eye-rolling, neighbor panicking, for male prostate pleasure, passivity, anality, was being put out there. And even though it was used for laughs, it was reminding men, whatever their sexual preference or orientation, um, that it, the anus was potentially an organ of pleasure. And that, that is quite a departure. We're now in a situation 10, 15 years on where um, prostate massages of all shapes and baffling sizes fill the pages of online non-gay sex stores. Men's mags such as Esquire and Men's Health interrupt their guides to the mysteries of the female body to give advice on how to get your girlfriend to massage your prostate just right whilst giving you a blowjob. And entire books are devoted to the subject, promising you the title of one book, The Ultimate Guide to Prostate Pleasure. Uh, oh, and the um, <laughs> last year, the, a, a giant green butt plug was unveiled in Paris. I don't know if you remember that. Um, It caused a scandal. Uh, there we are. Uh, mm. The author, the, the uh, artist, knew what he called it Christmas tree, <laughs> but that was just a way of making it even more scandalous. Um, it's pretty obvious what it is. And this is in Paris, the city of monuments, the city of the Eiffel Tower. In fact, I think there was a monument next to it which had been sheathed uh, when this was inflated. Um, actually, it was sabotaged because it did cause an outrage for some people in France, and um, somebody stuck a pin or a knife in it one night, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't repaired. But anyway, um, uh, oh, there's also uh, uh, Harvard University last year um, offered seminars on anal sex titled What's What in the Butt? Anal Sex 101, uh, where you can learn anal ana anatomy and the potential for pleasure for all genders. Yes, of course, it's absolutely true that not all men enjoy their prostates being massaged, whether they're straight or gay. But the outing of the prostate gland as a potential organ of passive male pleasure, of male versatility, regardless of sexuality, frees gay and bisexual men from the very heavy burden of representing all male anal pleasure. And straight men from having to be full-time studs. 
Um, and so I think that this, this development is, uh, is one to be welcomed. Uh, not only does it change the way we think of the male body and the idea of sex to some extent, it also releases gay and bisexual men from that very heavy burden of having to represent all male passivity and all potential of uh, pleasure for the prostate gland. I could show that ad that I showed again <laughs> yesterday again, but I think probably, how, how many people were here yesterday? Quite a few. There, there's an, an, a Ford ad, which I'm rather fond of, which is for keyless entry, and the name keyless entry is quite evocative too. But uh, in this ad, essentially, it's heavily implied that this young man, this attractive young man, is using a Ford key fob as a sex toy. Again, primetime television. And I think the, important of, the importance of this is to recognize that uh, you know, these, these changes are happening. And things are not as hegemonic or static as we might sometimes think. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>